Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. Just to let you know, today's episode does contain strong language and some scenes of a distressing nature. Please be advised. Matt, do you remember at school, on your yearbook, you used to write who you would think would do certain things in the future? Yes. And I was just thinking, can you remember who would have been the kid in your class that would have been a spy? Yeah, a guy called Simon Kipling, a right old sneak. (laughs) Very sus. Okay, this is fun. Um, What about most likely to play for England? I actually went to school with someone who played for England. No, you didn't. Yeah, Jermaine Genus (gasps) from Match of the Day. We were in the same form at school and he was playing for Forest. While we were at school, then went for Newcastle, Spurs and played for England. So you didn't even need to crystal ball it. He was already doing it. It was already happening. Okay. What else did they have? Oh, they had some mean ones, didn't they? What about (laughs) most likely to die a virgin? (laughs) Oh, um, I didn't agree with it, but that was me. Right. Yeah. Quite sad, really. But I mean, even sadder is I am on track to achieve that. Right. Friday, the 25th of May, 1951. Seven Oaks, Kent. Burgess pulls up outside McLean's sprawling three story detached house, tucks the travel documents safely in the glove compartment, checks his watch. They're booked on a ship that leaves at midnight, and Burgess has to get them both on it. He looks up, sees McLean running towards him. His eyes are wild, his face deathly white. I can't do this. I, I, I can't leave my family. I'll take my chances here. He grabs McLean's arm. You'll hang for treason. We all will. Get in the car. You must be Donald's colleague. It's great to meet you. He spins around to see McLean's smiling wife. Notices she's heavily pregnant. Looks down to see two small boys clinging to her dress. They stare up at him with wide, innocent eyes. He hears himself mutter a vague apology that they can't stay. Opens the car door. But it's Don's birthday. At least stay for dinner. He hears McLean whisper in his ear. Please, one last meal. He checks his watch, smiles over at Melinda. A quick supper then. He sits at the table, pushing food around his plate, as Melinda excitedly tells them how much she and McLean are looking forward to the arrival of their new baby. Oh, I almost forgot. Go get your father's gifts, boys. He watches the children jump down from their seats, grab their paintings and present them proudly to their father. McLean's eyes glisten as he looks at the pictures. His voice breaks as he tells them, I am so proud of you both. Look after mummy while I'm away. For a brief second, Burgess wishes he could swap places. Let McLean stay with his family. Instead, he mutters miserably, I'm afraid we really do need to go. He looks away as McLean kisses Melinda. Hears his choked voice tell her, I'll see you Monday, darling. Burgess accelerates into the gloomy night, trying to block out McLean's sobbing. Through his gasps for breath, McLean manages to whisper, This is torture! How can this be for the greater good? Burgess tries to adopt a cheery tone. We just need to get you to Russia. Who knows? They might be able to join you. But the truth is, Burgess doesn't believe that. He has no idea what awaits them when they get behind the Iron Curtain. And seeing McLean and his family has shaken him. He thought he knew what they were giving up when they started spying, but he never thought it would come to this. As he presses down on the accelerator, Burgess grips the steering wheel to try and hide his shaking hands. Because the whole house of cards is coming down around them and they've only got themselves to blame. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, last episode, we met the Cambridge spies and we learned about that meteoric rise through all arms of the British establishment. What did you take away from last week's ep? 
I quite liked that ideological optimism at the start. I thought it was quite sweet that they wanted an alternative to the way that Britain was run. They were looking for something else. But that transforms itself from just effectively being a teenage radical to becoming genuinely deeply involved. And the reality of that involvement is really stark. They're genuinely committed to the communist cause and Philby nearly dies from a Soviet shell in Spain. I mean, you don't really get more hardcore than that. That's all true and I think all pertinent. But the answer I was looking for was Burgess attending a fascist ping pong orgy. But you know, like you get points for yours as well. Yeah, oddly, the fascism was the most acceptable part of that scenario. (laughs) But it's amazing that in their own ways, their commitment has absolutely paid off. And we go into this episode with Burgess and Philby at the height of their power. Yes, but don't forget, we are making British scandals, so we are due a sharp downward turn, which is exactly what we got with the Russian defector who was ready to spill the beans at the end of the last episode. Oh, that was a Russian accent you were doing, was it? You're so rude. Can we turn off the mic, please? Have you spent some time in Germany? You're a vile little man. This is episode two, The Volkov Affair. 6 years earlier, September 1945, the Lamp Pub, Hoban, London. Burgess stares at a young serviceman across the room. He's been watching him for the past hour, waiting for a sign. Eventually, the young man finishes his pint, smiles at Burgess, raises an eyebrow and leaves. Burgess downs his whiskey and heads into the street. OK, so what's going on here? Is he on an intel gathering exercise or is this something else? That's exactly what I was thinking, because as a spy, unfortunately, the signal for I've got some documents in a brown envelope, raised eyebrow, nod of the head, is the same as I got something else for you in my pants. And what is it? A USB stick. <laughs> Do they have those in 1945? <laughs> He follows the serviceman down the steps to the public lavatory. OK, I don't think it is an intel gathering exercise. I think it's leisure and or pleasure rather than business. He knows this spot well. It's one of his favourite haunts. And it's more popular than ever. London's been full of demobbed soldiers recently, and Burgess intends to enjoy as many of them as possible before they all disappear back to the provinces. He leans against the chipped tiled walls, waits for the serviceman to come out of the cubicle, He won't have sex here. It's too risky. He's been arrested once for indecency already. He'll rent a room nearby. He heads over to the porcelain urinal, undoes his zip. Suddenly, a hand clamps on his shoulder. He spins around, ready to face a policeman. But it's Kim Philby. Burgess feels a knot tighten in the pit of his stomach. Philby gestures towards the exit. They hurry along the busy street. Burgess practically running to keep up with Philby. Kim, what is going on? Philby pulls Burgess into an alley and starts pacing. I just came from MI6. We're fucked. They have intel about Soviet spies in Britain from a high-ranking Russian defector. Burgess grips onto the wall, all the colour draining from his face. Who is it? His name's Volkov. He's cut a deal to hand over our names in return for money and a new life in the West. I'm being sent to Istanbul to interview him. They fall silent as a group of office workers pass by. Burgess lights a cigarette, tries to stop himself from shaking. When they've gone, Philby tells him in a nervous stutter. Contact your handler. Get Moscow to protect us. I'll delay as much as I can, but they need to be quick. The sooner Volkov's packed off to some camp in Siberia, the better. Burgess watches Philby leave the alley, heading to a busy tube station. He throws down his cigarette and crushes it, then heads back onto the street and makes his way to a red phone box. His hands shake as he waits for an answer. If Philby falls, he will too. And so will McLean. They'll all be arrested for treason. And every one of them could hang. As soon as he hears his handler's voice, he hunches over the receiver. We need to meet. Tonight. (laughs) 11am the following Saturday. Istanbul. Philby sits in the back of a taxi as it weaves through traffic. He takes in the bomb-damaged buildings, watches a group of officers in white naval uniforms dodge the path of a small donkey cart. A few minutes later, he walks through the manicured gardens of the consulate. 
hears a booming voice behind him. Philby, how the hell are you? He turns to see the British ambassador, Morris Peterson, a neat man with a small mouth and offset eyes. Philby hasn't seen him since Spain, when Peterson was the ambassador there. He puts on the warmest smile. Morris, lovely to see you again. Peterson shakes his hand. Fearless, Philby. You still got your medal from Franco. Philby smiles. You'll have to bury me with it. Peterson's eyes shine with admiration. Then he lowers his voice. This whole Volkov business. Of course, we need to get this man to safety as quickly as we can. Philby nods earnestly. Couldn't agree more. His mind races to find a way to delay. Eventually, he stutters. How's your lovely wife, by the way? He watches Peterson grin. Why don't you come and have lunch with us on the yacht tomorrow? Find out for yourself. We can chat about Volkov then. The following morning, he lies on a sun lounger on the large ambassadorial yacht, makes small talk with Mrs. Peterson and gazes out at the glistening turquoise sea as a waiter brings him an aperitif. Peterson holds his glass up. To Russian defectors! Philby sips his drink, lets his smile fade. Of course, Volkov could be lying. I'd like to interview him alone first. Figure out if he's authentic or not. Peterson frowns. You think he could be some kind of fraudster? Philby shrugs. He wouldn't be the first. Russians can be slippery. He watches Peterson nod. I'll sit in with you. I'm a good judge of character. Oh, everything Philby suggests, Peterson keeps doing the wrong thing. Also looks to camera. I don't think you are, Peterson, my darling. Philby stares in horror, then forces a smile as Peterson goes on. Don't worry, Philby. We'll figure out if the blighter's lying. He watches Peterson lie back on the sun lounger, tries to sound calm as he thanks him through his fixed grin. He adjusts his sunglasses, lies back himself, and desperately tries to work out what to say tomorrow when Volkov names him as a Russian spy. Next day, apartment block, Istanbul. Volkov leads his wife, Zoya, away from the window. You might be seen. It's too dangerous. He closes the ill-fitting orange curtains, tries to adjust his eyes to the gloom as he guides Zoya back to the table. The air is thick with cigarette smoke and dust from the street below. They've been hiding in this apartment all weekend. Today, though, a car from the British consulate will take them to safety. He pours them both a vodka, watches Zoya tremble as she drinks. Why aren't they here yet? Volkov downs his drink, tries to calm his own nerves. She's right. Where are they? I'm like this when people are late. I've never had this experience ever because I've obviously never arrived anywhere before anybody else, but I can imagine my first thought would be, are they dead? I'd stop pacing around doing shots of vodka. <laughs> you actually probably do. Is that why there's always several shot glasses at your side whenever I arrive at the studio? He slides over to the window, carefully pushes aside the curtain and looks into the street. Is it Zem? He feels himself slump as he shakes his head. He watches a couple of medics climb out of an ambulance and unload a stretcher. He looks up the street. There's no sign of the embassy car. He sits back at the table and puts his hands on the small case in front of him. It contains the code names of the British spies who have infiltrated the Foreign Office and Intelligence Services. He's memorised them all, just in case. Oh, it's um, Kim Flippin... What's his name? Tall guy with trilby hat, glasses. He's got the same name as your brother's friend from year two. Also with this slot, you're like, oh, five guys, that they're, they're posh. Well, they went to university, they went to Cambridge. <laughs> he jumps to his feet, looks at Zoya. For a second, they both stand, frozen. His mind races. Perhaps the car's parked in another street. Maybe the British didn't want to draw attention to it. He calls through the door. Who is it? Mr Volkov, we've come to collect you. He looks back at Zoya and smiles. She's so relieved her eyes sparkle with tears. He opens the door 
a group of medics stand in front of him. For a brief moment, he stares at them, confused. Then he's hurled backwards as they push their way in. One throws him to the floor as another wheels in two stretchers. He tries to call out to Zoya, but someone's covering his mouth. His eyes widen in horror as he sees a large needle, feels a stabbing pain in his arm. He tries to turn his head to see his wife, but he can't move. He's already a dead weight. He can only hear her muffled screams. He watches helpless as the men take out rolls of bandage and start to wrap his face. Then start to lift him onto one of the stretchers. He wants to plead with them to take him and let Zoya go, but no sound comes out. The last thing he feels is a numb, terrifying weakness. And then... Nothing. 20 minutes later, British Consulate, Istanbul. Philby pushes tobacco into his pipe, tries hard not to look terrified. Volkov's due to arrive any minute, and Philby still doesn't have a plan. You're kidding me. I mean, this guy is at the top of British intelligence, and he hasn't even got a basic plan to deal with something that he knew was bound to happen. I feel edgy when I haven't decided what I want from the menu and the waitress comes back for the second time and you have to do that panicked order. This, this is cutting it way too fine for me. He feels a knot in his gut as he glances over at Peterson. He's on the phone to Volkov right now. He watches Peterson mop his forehead with his silk handkerchief, strains to listen to the conversation, but all he can hear is his own blood pounding in his ears. Eventually, Peterson hangs up, but he doesn't move. He's just staring down at the phone. I'll be damned. Volkov's changed his mind. Philby stares in disbelief as Peterson scratches his head. Thing is, I don't think that was him. Philby shuffles uneasily. What? I know Volkov's voice. That man, whoever he was, wasn't Volkov. Hear me out. Do you think it could have been Alice Levine impersonating Volkov? (laughs) No, because he wouldn't have been able to tell the difference, am I right? Anyone? (laughs) Philby's mind races. He clears his throat. Uh, Are you sure it wasn't him? Perhaps the line was bad. He watches Peterson frown. I'll ring the Russian consulate now. Don't worry, Philby. I'll get to the bottom of this. Philby's hands tremble as he pushes the tobacco further into his pipe and listens as Peterson barks out commands down the phone. I want to speak to one of your employees, Konstantin Volkov. Peterson's face turns grey. What the hell is going on? They're denying he even existed. Philby can't believe it. It's clear the Russians managed to get to Volkov before the British. He feels his body relax for the first time in days. He's safe. But that was too close. He needs to get back to London, consolidate his role in MI6, and make sure he never gets into such a compromising position again. He is so lucky. The odds of the Russians turning up in that moment and getting to him first are incredible. I mean, it is certainly the pattern of privilege as well, isn't it? That each of these moments of high risk result in absolutely no consequences for them. And it's so funny that Philby will have been sat there thinking, well, I just hope something turns up. And it did. An ambulance full of fake Russian medics. Fell in his lap. I don't know if you ever have this daydream, but you know if you're on the way to a job or to a party or to something where you think, I really don't want to go to this. I don't want to get hit by a bus, but maybe if I just got, like, incapacitated slightly. You're looking at me like... It's just, I remember you turned up to my birthday party on crutches three years running. (laughs) Hard not to take it personally. Two days later, Philby's back in London. He meets Burgess at the Gargoyle for a celebratory drink. But Burgess looks like he hasn't slept for days. His clothes are dirty, and he's nervously chewing his filthy fingernails. Philby hunches over his brandy glass as he tells him how close the whole thing was. Moscow took too long. I was minutes away from utter disaster. Burgess shrugs, drunkenly fumbles for a cigarette. It's done now. You're safe. He's dead. Philby feels his mouth slacken. 
dead. I thought they'd question him, send him to a camp somewhere. Burgess sneers. You thought Stalin might give him a ticking off? They put him and his wife on a medical flight to Moscow, interrogated them until they broke, then shot both of them. Philby stares at him in horror, wonders how he could have been so naive. He drains his glass, orders another brandy and tries to collect his thoughts. He desperately seeks another solution, but he's got no choice but to return to work. Write his report on the Volkov affair. He'll blame Ambassador Peterson, draw an official line under the whole wretched business, and just hope he never hears the name Konstantin Volkov ever again. You can totally see how, as an idealistic university student, you get caught up in being anti-capitalist and wanting a different system. Fast forward 10 years, fundamentally, what they got involved with has completely changed. Yes, this brutality was not what they were talking about when they were recruited all those years ago as young men. And I imagine that that naivety is some kind of protective shield for Philby, because if he actually thinks about the consequences, the brutality that has been meted out because of his actions, it would be very difficult to keep moving forwards. Whereas actually, if you say... Probably what's happening is people are acting out diplomatic protocols because of this intel that I've collected. You can bury your head in the sand and you can keep going. Yeah, there's an element of willful blindness about it. The Lesser Dead is a new podcast available ad-free and exclusively on Wondery Plus. I'm going to tell you about a year, 1978. This isn't a story about nice people doing nice things. This is a story about monsters real ones and if you like those kind of stories it means you're bad it means there's something broken in you you're lesser like me joey peacock and his unconventional family of vampires live in the tunnels of new york city where their fearsome leader margaret mcmanus has kept them safe for decades until one night when they discover three little kid vampires and their world is turned upside down forever the Lesser Dead stars Minnie Driver, Jack Kilmer, Danny Houston, and Saul Rubinek. You can listen to it ad-free and exclusively on Wondery Plus. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Meet Jill Evans. Jill's got it all. A big house, fast car, two kids, and a great career. But Jill has a problem. When it comes to love, Jill can never seem to get things right. And then along comes Dean. I can't believe my luck. Whoa, I've hit the jackpot. It looks like they're going to live happily ever after. But on Halloween night, things get a little gruesome. This is where the shooting happened outside a building society in New Romney. It's thought the 42-year-old victim was killed after he opened fire on police. And Jill's life is changed forever. From Wondery and Novel comes Stolen Hearts, a story about a cop who falls in love with a man who is not all he seems to be. Follow Stolen Hearts wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge the entire series ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app now. Four years later, 1949, Istanbul. Philby runs down the hospital corridor, grabs a doctor. Eileen Philby, where is she? The doctor gestures to a room a little further along. Philby bursts in, panting, looks down at his sleeping wife. Her head is bandaged, her hair matted with blood. He slumps down in a plastic chair and puts his head in his hands. An hour ago, he got a call at work from the police saying she'd been attacked by a stranger and left for dead. He'd gone cold with fear. All he can think of now is finding the man who tried to kill her. Philby had hoped he'd seen the last of Istanbul after the Volkov affair. But here he is, working at the consulate. And now his wife has been brutally attacked. Eileen's eyes flicker open. He touches her arm gently. Who did this? Did you see him? She turns away and faces the wall. Mr Philby? He follows the doctor into the corridor. Your wife needs complete rest. She can go home tomorrow... But don't let her become agitated or upset. Philby runs his hand through his hair. Have the police taken a statement? The doctor steps back, lowers his voice. 
Mr. Philby, this was a self-inflicted wound. No one else was involved. Oh, my God. He stares at the door, then back at Eileen. I... I don't understand. Next day, he drives her home in silence. Eventually, he blurts out, Why would you do such a thing to yourself? She glares at him, furious. I know you're having an affair. Secret phone calls, late night meetings. I'm not stupid. At least it got your attention. He stares at her, shocked. They've had this argument countless times. He'd thought after they'd got married a few years ago, she'd finally believe he wasn't seeing another woman. When he speaks, his voice shakes. Why can't you trust me? He watches her turn away. He loves her, but he knows he's making her miserable. He'd love to tell her the truth, but he can't. When she's in bed, he pours himself a large whiskey and looks at a telegram on the table. His eyes widen as he reads it. It's from the chief in London, offering him the post of the new MI6 representative in Washington. He drains his glass and frowns. It's a brilliant opportunity. He'd be working closely with the CIA and FBI. He'd have access to every bit of sensitive material and every nuclear secret the Americans have. He pours himself another drink, gazes for a moment at the sunset. He knows another move could unsettle Eileen. The doctor's orders ring in his ears. But perhaps a fresh start would be good for her. A nice big house in Washington. Good schools for the kids. She'd be happy with that. In fact, this move might just save their marriage. He'll contact London tomorrow, accept the offer. And if he can please his wife and Moscow at the same time, all the better. A few months later, November 1949, Tangier, Morocco. Burgess sits up against the wall of the hot, empty hammam, stripped to the waist. The dry heat of the sauna makes his skin prickle, and he closes his eyes, enjoying the sensation of sweating out the night before. I last about a minute in these places. I can't imagine you in this situation. I get hot and sweaty even not in a sauna. You're perpetually in a hammam. Just to give the listeners some context, you've put the room, at, I, I presume it's, I can't quite see the display, but minus 17, is it in here? Something like that, yeah. yeah. You're like a snake, aren't you? You've said that before. <laughs> and I don't even relate it to the temperature. His reverie is broken by a polite cough from the other side of the room. He opens his eyes, but his breath catches in his throat. It's Volkov, back from the dead. This is terrifying. He smiles at Burgess but half of his face is obscured by bandages. The heat suddenly feels oppressive, claustrophobic. P please don't hurt me. Burgess hears himself whimper, cowering into the corner of the room, but there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Volkov slowly approaches, the smile fixed on his face. As he comes closer, the bandages unravel to reveal Volkov's bloody, beaten face. There's blood everywhere. It's filling the room. Burgess starts to scream. Burgess wakes up, bolt upright, clutching the sweat-drenched sheets in his fists. Oh, thank God. He tries to calm his breathing, remind himself it's not real. But he's shaken. Ever since the whole business with Volkov, he's been having this dream every single night. When his breathing slows, his fear is replaced with the familiar heaviness of a hangover. His head throbs. He reaches for a glass of water on the hotel nightstand. He has a vague recollection of getting drunk in a bar owned by an expat criminal, then standing on a table with a glass of whiskey and soda, denouncing American imperialism. He turns over and comes face to face with a naked young man lying fast asleep on top of the sheets. He lifts his aching body out of the bed, heads for the bathroom. His forehead is cut and swollen. He suddenly remembers falling in the street outside the bar, being helped to his feet by a local MI6 officer and his wife, and telling them both how much he loved Russia. 
so funny, like the drunken anxiety of a double agent. <laughs> like usually it's like, oh no, did I say something rude? Did I make a fool of myself? And this is like, did I spill all of my secrets and give away my cover? He splashes his face, looks into his own bloodshot eyes, realises he's hardly been sober since Volkov disappeared. He grabs a dressing gown, wraps it around himself. He expects room service, but instead, his mother stands there, arms folded, lips tight with anger. Is he still in his nightmare? (laughs) This is even scarier. Where were you yesterday? I waited all day in my room. She cranes her neck to see who else is with him. He shoes her away, gently closing the door on her, and remembers why he's in Tangier in the first place. He'd taken two weeks off from his job at the Foreign Office, promised his mother a relaxing time, sightseeing in the sun. But when he got here, he abandoned her, got steaming drunk, and tried to seduce a Moroccan boy he'd eyed in a bar. An hour later, he's helping his mother into a taxi when he spots the MI6 officer from last night hurrying over. You ought to know, I've filed an official complaint about you. You're a bloody disgrace, Burgess. A few days later, he's back in his London office, sitting opposite his furious boss in his disciplinary. He stares down at his filthy fingernails, then nervously puts them in his mouth and starts to chew as his boss rants. What the hell were you playing at? Spouting off nonsense about loving Russia? Denouncing American imperialism? Have you lost your mind? He starts to fluff a reply, but his boss lifts his hand for silence. Your position here is now untenable. He feels his body jolt forward in shock. He starts to shake, hears his terrified voice start to plead. It won't happen again, sir. I banged my head in the fall. I didn't know what I was saying. His boss glares at him. If it was up to me, I'd sack you, but the powers that be have saved your skin. One last chance. I'm sending you to the British Embassy in Washington. I want you as far away from here as possible. Burgess feels his throat tighten. The thought of leaving London terrifies him. His whole life is here. His clubs, his lovers. Most of all, he hates the thought of being in America. He meant what he said when he denounced American imperialism. And if he gets into trouble in Washington... He can't name drop or use his old Eton tie to get out of it. But he doesn't have a choice. He lights a cigarette, inhales deeply and nods. He'll make the most of his last days in London. And when he does get to Washington, he'll do everything he can to get sent straight back. 19th of January, 1951. Kim Philby's house, Washington. Philby nods to the waiter to pour wine for his guests. He's holding a formal dinner party for his friend Guy Burgess. He'd promised his handler he'd do everything he could to help Burgess settle into Washington society. He's worked for weeks to get major players from the CIA here tonight. And now they're all sitting with their immaculately dressed wives, making polite small talk. The trouble is, Burgess hasn't turned up. Philby smiles apologetically at his guests. Guy must be stuck at work. I'm sure he'll be here soon. He grins, but he's furious. Burgess has been here for seven months now. He's even given him a room in his house. But Burgess has spent most of his time getting drunk. Eileen whispers in his ear. Cook says we have to serve the food, or it'll be ruined. He nods, watches the waiters set down plates of roast beef. You didn't wait for me then. The room falls silent. Everyone stares at Burgess. He's wearing a badly stained camel hair coat. He's swaying, waving a bottle of gin. And his hands are filthy. Still. Do you think he needs to be taught, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were retaught how to wash our hands. He sort of needs the hand over hand, hand over hand, in between the fingers. What did you have to do? Happy birthday, was it? Oh, the Russian national anthem, surely. <laughs> Workers of the world unite. <laughs> and done. Philby feels his cheeks flush. He jumps up, hisses in his ear. What the hell are you playing at? Sit down and sober up. Philby pastes on a charming smile for his guests as he guides Burgess to his seat, sits him down next to a large, balding man with a thick neck. 
It's Bill Harvey, head of counterintelligence at the CIA. Bill is in charge of investigating Soviet spy rings, and he's one of the most feared men in Washington. You have a wonderful face. Can I draw you? Philby looks up, alarmed. Burgess is talking to Harvey's wife, Libby. He watches her smile. Why, of course you can. Philby feels a pang of hope. Burgess is an impressive sketch artist. He might just charm the room yet. He feels the atmosphere relax as everyone compliments the food. A few minutes later, Burgess hands over the sketch to Libby. I do hope I've done you justice. Philby watches Libby's face fall as she stares at the drawing. She jumps to her feet and storms out in tears. Her husband grabs the sketch, then throws a punch at Burgess, who falls back on his chair. The other guests jump up, drag Harvey away. Philby picks up the sketch and stares in horror. He's given Libby an enormous pointy chin that juts out like the prow of a battleship. Her dress is pulled up around her waist, and he's given her massive, curly pubes. But he has had the decency to not include her sticky-out ears, so in many ways, he's also been complimentary. He watches Burgess wipe blood from his nose, resists the urge to punch him himself. How could you? The awkward silence is only broken when Eileen bursts into tears. A few minutes later, Phil B stands at the front door, apologises to the men, drapes fur coats over the women, tries not to cry as he grovels. But he already knows the damage is done. Nothing he can say will change tonight. It'll be gossiped about for years. His reputation is destroyed. Guy Burgess may be his oldest and closest friend, but he's become a liability. If Philby wants to maintain cover and keep living this double life, he'll have to cut all ties. Forever. April 1951, Griffith Stadium, Washington, D.C. Philby shoves his hands in his pockets, tries to look interested in the baseball game. He's there with CIA intelligence chief Bill Harvey. Philby is desperate to pick his brains, but he has to play this carefully, especially after the dinner party with Burgess. A few days ago, Philby got word that CIA cryptanalysts had cracked Russian codes. They've worked out the code name of a prominent spy, and Philby needs to know who it is. They watch in silence as the pitcher strolls into position. He clears his throat and apologises again for Burgess's drunken behaviour. I've asked him to leave. I couldn't possibly let him live with us after he upset you and your wife so badly. Harvey tightens the scarf around his thick neck, but he doesn't take his eyes off the game. He's a good friend of yours, right? Something in Harvey's voice puts him on alert. He feels his jaw tighten. I wouldn't say he's a friend, exactly. More like someone I've bumped into over the years. I don't like him, and I don't trust him. Harvey turns back to the game. Even though it's a cold day, Philby feels a trickle of sweat race down his forehead. Philby starts to casually mention the cracked code. Marvellous news. And have you found out who this particular code name refers to? Play it cool, Philby, mate. He watches Harvey's round face crease into a taunting smile. And wouldn't you like to know? All in good time, Philby. Let's just enjoy our game while it lasts. Next day, Philby sits in an oyster restaurant with Harvey's colleague at the CIA, James Angleton. Harvey wouldn't take the bait yesterday, so Philby's hoping that Angleton might be more forthcoming. Philby cracks the lobster shell. You have to hand it to Harvey. A code name is a game changer. He watches Angleton push up his black rimmed glasses. Angleton's no pushover. He's famous in the CIA for uncovering spies himself. But Philby knows how much rivalry there is between Angleton and Harvey and how much Angleton would love to one-up him. A code name is all we have. It's some guy the Russians call Homer. That ring a bell? Philby slowly chews the lobster meat. 
Never heard of it. Sorry. He busies himself with his food, but his appetite is gone. In fact, right now, he's doing everything he can to keep the contents of his stomach down. Because he knows full well who Homer is. It's his old friend from Cambridge. His comrade, Donald McLean. A few days later, Chinatown, Washington. Philby turns up his collar, ducks into a lantern-lit doorway, makes his way to the back of the restaurant and slides into a booth. He listens for a moment to the soothing music being piped in. It's why he's chosen this place. The music will make it difficult for anyone to eavesdrop. He looks up as Burgess collapses into the seat opposite. He's unshaven, his jacket is crumpled and dirty, and he's steaming drunk. I can only imagine the state of his fingernails. Don't even ask me. Would a bit of Carex kill him? But right now, he's Philby's only chance of getting McLean to safety. Imagine you had to rely on this guy. Your literal life depends on it, and he's the drunkest person you know. This is really scraping the barrel, isn't it? It's quite an interesting conundrum because there's so many things acting on Philby. Obviously, Philby can't do this himself. He is in such a great position and and can't be compromised. Burgess is sort of already a ruined man, so he can't fall much further. But it feels like it's self-interest, it's loyalty. It's almost like a schoolboy pact, isn't it, that they will stick together to the bitter end. Philby hands Burgess a set of travel documents. He goes over the plan. You'll arrive in Southampton in one week's time. Contact your handler first. Then... McLean. Don't tell him he's been compromised until the day before you leave. I don't want him to panic. You get him across Europe to Prague. Burgess pushes away the plate of shredded duck and puts a soggy cigarette in his mouth. Philby snatches it away. Listen to me. If you don't do this right, they'll hang us for treason. All of us. Do you understand? He watches the colour drain from Burgess's face. His bloodshot eyes look panicked. What if he's already being watched? What if we're arrested? Philby folds his hands to stop them shaking. He knows it's a risk. He leans forward. Nobody knows who Agent Homer is. Not yet. Even when the Brits work it out, they won't have enough evidence to arrest McLean. They fall silent as the waiter clears the table. What if McLean won't go? Philby folds his arms. He doesn't have a choice. Make him understand that. And whatever happens, don't go with him. They'll come for me straight away if you do. We're too intertwined in the intelligence community. Swear to me, you'll come back. One missing diplomat will cause a stir. Two will cause an uproar. Especially since everyone in Washington knows Burgess and Philby are friends. Believe me, I have no intention of living anywhere but London. He watches Burgess stagger to his feet and put on his hat. Philby catches his arm. One more thing. For God's sake, stay sober. He watches Burgess nod before he heads off into the night. Philby waits until he's sure they're not being followed and then heads out into the darkness himself. It's out of his hands now. All he can do is wait and hope that MI5 don't catch them before McLean can get to safety behind the Iron Curtain. Four days later, Prague. Burgess follows McLean out of the airport and squints at the bright sunlight. His whole body aches with exhaustion. He's hardly slept since they left Southampton. He shuffles forward in a taxi queue, watches McLean turn his back against the cold wind to light a cigarette. They've spent the past four days zigzagging across Europe by train, before finally catching a flight from Bern. All he wants now is to hand McLean over as quickly as possible and get back to Washington. A few minutes later, a heavily dented Skoda pulls up. He and McLean climb in. Burgess rests his elbow on the window and massages his aching temples. He gazes out at the shelled buildings and bullet-peppered walls. They should have arrived two days ago, 
but their flight from Switzerland was delayed. It'll raise some eyebrows. Somehow, he'll have to explain it to his superiors. The taxi pulls up outside the bullet-scarred Soviet embassy. Burgess gives their names to the uniformed officer at the desk, then sits next to McLean in an empty corridor, closes his eyes and falls asleep. He's woken by a squat, bold man in a shiny suit. He looks for McLean, but he's gone. We have a few questions for you, Mr. Burgess. He follows the man to a large room with thick, dusty curtains, spends the next hour answering questions about the journey. Did anyone try to stop them? Who did they speak to? Surely McLean's told you all this. The man stares at him for a few seconds, nods silently, then opens a drawer, pushes a bottle of vodka and a small glass across the table. Burgess has been sober for four days, but he's delivered McLean now, so he pours himself a drink, then another, lets the warmth seep into his empty stomach. I need to get back to Washington. Put me on a flight tonight. The man smiles. Of course, my apologies. We've delayed you enough. He lets his shoulders drop with relief, grabs the bottle and follows the man out to a waiting car. A short while later, he's ushered through the airport gates. He staggers, exhausted and bleary-eyed, up the steps of the plane, collapses into his seat and falls asleep. When he wakes up, his mouth is dry and his head throbs. He presses lightly on his eyelids as the plane touches down. He has to clear his head, figure out a convincing story about where he's been for the past few days. He straightens his tie, looks out of the window, and sits bolt upright with shock. He isn't in Washington. He's in Moscow. His breath sticks in his throat. He has no idea how this happened. And no idea how to get back. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, The Cambridge Spies. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read My Silent War by Kim Philby. Guy Burgess, The Spy Who Knew Everyone by Stuart Purvis and Jeff Hulbert. Stalin's Englishman, The Lives of Guy Burgess by Andrew Lowney. Enemies Within by Richard Davenport Hines. And A Spy Among Friends by Ben McIntyre. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Karen Laws wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondering. <laughs>